I'm in New York. So this is gonna be about 59. That's Tadashi, okay? He plays guitar. I'm serenaded by Tadashi. If I were to summarize it, you know, <clears throat> Tadashi went all the way. You know, art was nine-tenths of his life, right? Mm. New York was incredibly far away from Hawaii in the 19, late 40s and early 50s. Um, it doesn't seem so far away now, but I think, I think the fact that they had the courage, um, that they had the desire, but then the courage to do that. And in Tadashi's case, initially he was leaving behind his new wife and new daughter and going off and doing, you know, this adventure alone. I mean, well, all he wanted to do was paint because he had this need inside. It was part of his life, and he just, he just had to do it. He always said, paint every day, paint every day. And, um, but you know, believe, really believe in yourself. He went without any kind of expectation, but he went with the uh, resolve that he was going to make it. Leaving Hawaii for artists like Sato and others, especially in that post-war period, really allowed them to engage a larger world, to perhaps reach beyond the insularity of the islands. But I think it also gave them appreciation when they returned home of how Hawaii really was the center because it was positioned both um, in, in the middle of the Pacific between the New York art world and of course, of course the cultural home of Japan that many of them had also visited. So Hawaii really was the center, not the periphery. Oh, he says here, art is long. My going back there, meaning Hawaii, is partly due to a rebellion, rather a revelation of a new vision, a new insight. I think I'm really beginning to paint. After eight years of formal training and work, it's only the beginning. Don't for a moment think that it's a form of resignation. No, no. A new journey. I feel I'm capable now to begin flapping my own wings. Tadashi sort of um, transformed nature substantially in his style, abstracted it, changed it, um, but still kept it beautiful, still kept it subtle. What he did was to develop this vocabulary of little um, sort of curved brush strokes, um, almost as if he was kind of feeling his way into the surface and the relationship of those brush strokes because of the way they were placed on the canvas would catch the light differently. So you'd see this thing kind of start to shimmer and almost pulse. I mean, you think about something as sort of insubstantial as air or as ever moving as water. Um, those things, I think, Tadashi learned how to capture. And so the process of the way he worked with the brush really was meant to capture things that almost sort of went beyond the scene. Later on especially, he said that he felt fortunate that he was able to make a living painting things that he wanted to paint as opposed to what other people wanted to see. He was able to just paint what he wanted to and have others appreciate it. Painting is um is a force working from within you. I can't classify it as, as, as work. Uh, it's, it's almost a, it's like work and yet it's, it's, it's a pleasure, struggling pleasure. Let's say. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, integrating art into architecture is something I'm really interested in and I'm always looking for opportunities for. So in this case, with the court building, here's a great opportunity. This is the place where some art could go in this big window because it ties to the central purpose for the building and since public art can have a whole other layer of meaning, we had an opportunity there. It was a collaborative process, so to me it was a neat collaboration because usually when you do art, it's just yourself. But now you're, you're having this whole group of people that uh, they want to be on the same page as you. Using water as the starting place for the art came from Doug. He connected the inspiration for his work from the, the beach at Anianiku, right in Kapolei, and looked at the water there and thought about that place. And so he made a kind of intellectual connection to the courthouse. It was mainly to portray five different aspects of Anianiku. Because water has uh, so many different moods. That, that's the most important thing. Doug Young worked with artisans at um, a glass manufacturing and artisan um, enterprise in Germany. And so he worked a lot with the people who are you know, masters of translating the color and the pattern into the glass. It's Peter's uh, Glass Malariae, which is like Peter's Glass Factory. And they have a factory and office in Paderborn and a another studio complex in Nuenbeacon, which is about five miles away. Because this was groundbreaking in size and in technique, um, they went all out to help us out the most they could. I had a certain advantage of being naive about it. You know, the naivete was uh, Good, because I kind of say, well, you know, this is what I want, and try to push it as far as they could do it. They could say, well, you know, we only can go this much, but now I said, well, can you do this or this? And then it would be, well, let's try it. You know, we've never done it before. So that was, to me, that was an advantage. When you look at the building, you'll see these large two-story windows. They're made up of more panels of glass. And uh, they occur exactly at each courtroom. Uh, the glass is um, a specialized glass. It's, for, it's called architectural glass. And you can't just uh, put this kind of glass, any kind of glass, up on buildings. You have to have a certain performance. One level of that glass is textured. It's called slumped. It has ripples in it that correspond to the design. So from the outside, you see the slumping, you see the, the curving of the glass. Then the inner glass layer has the color in it. As you get closer and closer, it has fine detail of little dots and bubbles and grains and um, all of that together. So architecture is important in the sense that we all you know, live and work in it and around it, so it's, it's part of us. And our built environment is a lot about but what we need to function, but also a reflection of who we are. You know, we're happier when we're in a place that somehow connects with us, our identity, I think. You know, we can go beyond this too, you know, because now we know technique-wise that this is possible. And I'm just saying, well, as an artist, we can push it further. As an artist, you're trying to do as best as you can. And whatever happens, uh, in the future, I don't think about that that much. It's just, you, you try to do the best you can at, at that point of your time. And you know, time will tell whether it becomes something that people will, will come and look at or, or remember. How do you invite 10 or 11 choirs from the mainland in Canada to come to Hawaii and introduce them to music from the Pacific Rim countries and get them to sound as one 
great choir in just six days. The key ingredients are a world-class conductor in Henry Leck, the beautiful setting in Hawaii with all the cultural riches, and a fabulous attitude by all the singers who come. What's your name? Sophia. Sophia, thank you. You know, when I conduct courses, there's certain faces that inspire me. And your face inspires me. <laughs> Every time you can sing, her eyes are there, and her head is there, and you, you sing every word and every note with passion. Thank you. <laughs> Give her a hand. Festival is this festival in which we creatively put together music from many of the nations and cultures in this region. The singers get an opportunity to add their own creativity to the process. For instance, we're doing a piece from the Torres Strait Islands and the movements were there for the first section and the last section. But once they learned the nature and the character of the movement, they got to create the whole center section themselves. The fact that it's new, the fact that the people that they know are new, the friends that they've made are new, the cultures they've learned are new. All of that comes together and that's what fosters this new idea of creativity. It inspires their soul. So the children are, are allowed to go into the Polynesian Cultural Center for several mornings and there they interact with the villagers from four different villages and they not only learn the customs and the dances and the movements but they start to pick up some of the wonderful traits of those villages and creatively move in all sorts of ways. By being respected, they themselves respect what they find. What a wonderful world. Can you just imagine them taking that back to Iowa, hula? Every moment that they're here is a unique and exciting, creative experience. We hope that they go home with a widened sense of the world, that they've come here from their region, which we honor, and that we're all a part of a bigger world.
if you look on the, the list of state buildings, the state capitol is building one. And the, it's arguably the most important building, and this is arguably the most important piece of artwork in the state. It's definitely the largest. So having it um, brought back to life, essentially, uh, is, is a good feeling. It's probably the most significant work of art in the state of Hawaii because it's in the center of this Capitol building, which is the center of our state. And so when people see that in the center of our whole state Capitol, and we have this work of art. So it's this jewel in the middle of the Capitol. You know, it started as a painting, sort of a human-sized painting. And then in, when the Capitol building was built, was translated into a glass mosaic. And over the years, it gets a lot of wear and tear in there. Uh, that mosaic has suffered, so what we're talking about now is its third incarnation. The mural had delaminated from it, separated, and so you had this band of the glass that was lifted off. And between there were these cracks, and as the cracks grew, more and more minerals would come through it, and they would get bigger and bigger and bigger. So you had these real obvious cracks that were forming in it. It was really my job to go in and figure out what went wrong with the existing conditions and what caused it and what it was going to take to fix it. We went with the old traditional manufacturing process of the glass, nothing new in high tech, where they create the glass, they slump it out and break it up and hand make these tiles. So each tile is irregular but approximately the same size. I had to know what colors to order in Italy, in Venice, uh, for, for this project. Only then we were able to start actually with our fabrication in Munich. What they did is they scanned the original painting by Tadashi and printed it out on paper, 100% to what the capital mural size is and they began to lay out the sections of the mural on those. The tables they built them on were not large. They never had the whole mural all at once. In fact, they would work on one section of it at a time and look at the ceiling and they have mirrors and that's how they could get the perspectives looking at it. That company was chosen because they've been doing mosaics since the 1800s and part of doing the, making the right choices, we didn't want it to fail again. So. They said if they install it, they'll guarantee it. It took them about two and a half weeks. And the first day they measured and oriented themselves, laid it out to see if it fit. And then immediately after, they did one whole section a day. I don't recognize myself as an artist. I'm doing artistic work. Um, we all, from our crew, we, uh, we translate, actually, artists' uh, uh, designs into the new medium mosaic. We always work with artists, and the artist is the most important. Of course, at the end, always, uh, that's, you know, at the end, we must say, that's a handmade work. Certain imperfections are actually part of the mosaic and um, that makes also the beauty of the mosaic. I think it says a lot about who we are as a people, that we don't have this dome with gold leaf on the interior. Like every other state, we are unique and we celebrate that. And the Aquarius mural for me sends a huge message to everyone in the world that we're different, we value our aina and our resources, and if the building were just concrete and a void of aesthetics, um, I think we would have a different perception of our government and our place. I think it's a huge part of what we call Hawaii.
Grazie. I came to New York City as an artist. I, I, I left wanting to be a musician. And that's the first thing I wanted to do when I came back to Hawaii. I wanted to be in a band. And so um, that's what happened to me. That's what happened to me. From the first time I heard a power chord, that was it. I was like, oh my God, what is this? That was the epiphany. Oh, that's, this is it. Something that is going to be a big part of my life for the rest of my life. And that's what it was. You know? My memories of Oriental Love Ring back in the, uh, back in the day, I mean, besides the hair, <laughs> um, the volume. The rock and roll life, was, it was a great life. Um, but I never wanted to leave Hawaii. I'm, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I love this place. And, you know, I've opened for great bands. I've played before thousands of people, you know. I, the only thing ever missing from, from my rock and roll story is money. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Peter Bond. I'm the rhythm guitar player and the vocalist for Oriental Love Ring. You know, I work uh, at Island Guitars, uh, repair guitars, um, surf on my off times, and play music whenever I can, get together with friends. It's all pretty, pretty quiet, mellow, easy going. I'm Larry Lieberman. I think all of us who have been doing this for a long time hit a point in our, in our lives where we have to decide are we going to pursue music as a final career choice? And if so, what are the implications for our lives? You can only do it for so long. It's only sustainable for so long before, okay, it's time to get a real job. And I had long hair at the time, and then that final moment when I cut my hair, that, that, that phase is done in my life. I gotta, get a, I gotta move on and get a career. My name is David Sumita, um, AKA Bino Shots. I work on the watercress farm, and I've been doing this for a while now. I've been doing this for about 27 years now, so that didn't change. My day job is David Sumita. My, my musician side, my music is Bino Shots. It was one night last year Chad called and he said, hey, you know, I'm having a barbecue at my house and, 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 and Peter and Larry are going to be there too. And um, bring your guitar. We started jamming and, and the first thing we started doing was the old Oriental Love Ring originals. And it just so many memories came back. So we just picked it up where we left it off 20 years ago. And it was just, just going with it again. Ready? I'm ready. None of us are under uh, the pretense of, that we're going to go out and make Oriental Lovering our career, you know? Uh, and I think that's a, that's a big difference now than it was 20 years ago for the guys in the band. Just have a good time, you know? The, you're back together with your friends again and just go with it. So that's how it's different this time, for me anyway. You know, there was a connection. We just knew right off the bat. We were just like, wow, this is great. You know, um, I got, you know, three of the best musicians that I've ever wanted to play with. Best feeling in the world. We're there because we want to be there. You know, there's no pot of gold at the end. It's just, damn, we're enjoying ourselves. So we'll do this as long as it's fun. I can definitely sense when all of us together are all on, it sounds like it takes on a life of its own. I feel really fortunate to be playing in this group because I do so love it. Why am I doing this? Um, I, I'm doing this because, because I, I have to. Um, it's, just, it's in my blood. I'm going to be doing this you know, for the rest of my life. I don't know if I'm going to be playing rock for the rest of my life. 
but I'm going to be playing music. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.